Good morning, everyone. I'm Hilary Seeley. I'm one of the pediatric endocrinologists here at Packard. We are very grateful for Dr. Bauer's visit over the past few days. He has been a mentor to me and to our group as we um, gain more expertise in pediatric thyroid care, especially for children with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. So this is um, a, a shot of our group. Um, and now it's um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Bauer. Uh, he is a professor of pediatrics in uh, endocrinology and diabetes at the Perelman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania. He's the director of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Thyroid Center. Um, his clinical and research interests span across the spectrum of pediatric thyroid disorders. In particular, he's been a leader in clinical and translational science research focused on pediatric thyroid cancer. He and his team have recently launched an international child and adolescent thyroid consortium to expand multi-center collaboration. And Dr. Bauer is currently serving as the chair of the American Thyroid Association Pediatric Thyroid Nodule and Thyroid Cancer Guidelines. So um, really looking forward to your talk, Andrew. So thank you for their introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It's really an honor to be on that list of really I don't know all the people, but they seem to be renowned. And just my time at Stanford is two days has been uh, created some envy of the location and the and the weather compared to Philadelphia. So I hope to come back um, as well and to continue our collaboration. Hillary and I are, are, have started and will continue to develop. So thank you to, for the invitation. Uh, Elsie and Ophelia have been really helpful. Uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to everybody, not just the leadership. Uh, and then David, of course, and Hillary have been really, really welcoming as rest of the endocrine crew and the whole our team that I've had the pleasure and honor of meeting in person actually over the last two days, which is remarkable in this time of COVID. Those are my disclosures. Uh, and this is kind of our mission for today. So because my interest is kind of broad in the land of thyroidology, which seems kind of small potentially for people that are more generalist, um, it's going to be a little bit of a lot of thyroid disease, and it, it really is a bunch of stuff. And it's kind of reflecting one my obsession with thyroid disease and trying to figure out avenues to improve care. Uh, and some of it is that there's a broad variety of people that attend Grand Round. So I hope to introduce, you know, and, and go over kind of data over the last 10 years that is applicable to individual practices and different levels of participants as far as their current educational and seniority as far as faculty. So why should we care about the thyroid? Well, we could care about it because it's interesting for TAD morphogenesis, which you know is kind of interesting that T3 and T4 are responsible for tadpoles uh, eventually turning into frogs. We could be interested because pandas actually have a mutation in one of the enzymes that's important for thyroid hormone production. And maybe that explains why they have a relatively low metabolic state um, and allows them to eat bamboo and otherwise be a relatively big animal. Uh, further research is needed to see if duox2 is related to sloth-like movement and cuteness, um, but this was published in Science out of China, so it is, you know, really in interesting. I think in the land is a thyroidologist for cocktail chatter, and then you may have, you know, pets at home that can develop thyroid disease. So, in full disclosure, I missed the diagnosis, and we have two cats that developed uh, hyperthyroidism. This has been noted in the New York Times, which I read, and somehow I missed this article. Um, but they present with, you know, polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss. They can have diabetes, but they actually can develop hyperthyroidism, which is not Graves' disease. It's autonomous nodules that undergo the same type of treatment. And if you think it's hard to give methamazole to kids, it's harder to give it to cats. And so if this ever happens to you, I'm help, happy to tell you our trials and tribulations of going through this. But ultimately, both have received radioactive iodine. And thankfully, as faculty, I got a $100 discount, and it only cost $1,200 per cat. One of them is converted to hypothyroidism with, and is currently on delicious chicken-flavored Levo. And the other is getting transdermal methimazole because he had a relapse, and he's 20 years old, and we don't want to put him through radioactive iodine again. But more importantly for us, you know, one in 10 of us are going to develop thyroid disorder over our, over our lifetime, and it's certainly more common in women than it is in men. Within our practice of pediatrics, a number of babies will develop, are going to be born with congenital hypothyroidism. And so the talk actually is kind of designed to go through the more common congenital hypothyroidism, 
to the less common. So we'll spend a little bit more time up front talking about just thyroid disease in general and congenital hypothyroidism, and then go into some more uh, less common disorders and just little bits on everything. And we've also all noticed, depending on your practice, that there's certainly an increased prevalence of autoimmune disease uh, in our practice. I didn't see Graves disease in preschool kids um, during my fellowship, and now we definitely have patients that are two and three years old that develop autoimmune hypo and even hyperthyroidism, similarly to diabetes and other autoimmune disorders. And as far as malignancies, uh, papillary thyroid cancer, which is the most common can uh, differentiated thyroid cancer in adults and pediatrics, is actually quite common in the land of you know, not every patient gets cancer, but for solid tumors in adolescent girls, papillary thyroid cancer is oftentimes in the top five, even as high as the top two, as far as uh, the prevalence of diagnosis. So the thyroid system is listed here. The important things to realize um, and just to take note of is the thyroid ultrasound. Um, thyroid tissue on ultrasound is typically uh, bright gray and uniformly gray as far as its echogenicity compared to strap muscles that are, in the, uh, are anterior to it between it and the, and the neck. And just like the rest of the endocrine system, it's designed on a feedback loop. So the pituitary makes TSH, the thyroid makes thyroid hormone, and it negatively regulates production of TSH and a feedback, negative feedback mechanism. During, during my education, my, the thyroid exam was kind of taught from, from a posterior perspective, but I think this is critically important that all of us develop a better way of doing thyroid exams, and maybe you're already doing this in your practice. But the first phases of a thyroid exam are inspection, 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 so you need to stand in front of the patient to complete that, and then it's palpation, and I stay in front of the patient uh, to complete that as well. When you do the neck exam, it's very helpful to know what levels of the neck, so you can describe what lymphadenopathy is. Level two lymph nodes are very common in our practices. Level three and four are very uncommon. And when you see that, you need to think about infection, you need to think about malignancy. And in the land of thyroidology, you need to think about papillothyroid cancer with regional lymph node metastasis. I'm so interested in trying to improve how we do physical exams. We published this in, in JAMA um, PEDS a couple of years ago, and we created a YouTube video almost a decade ago. So I look a little younger in that video. Um, and so far, it's at least had some favorable traffic or above 100,000 views on how to do it. And we consented patients. So we have a normal patient, a patient with metastatic thyroid cancer, which is the picture you can see here, patient with a nodule, patient with Graves disease, and kind of walk through the different findings uh, during that exam. So when thyroid hormone is produced, TSH binds to the TSH receptor at the thyrocyte, and then there's downstream um, impact from that. There's impact with increased expression of the sodium iodine symporter, which increases the movement of iodine into the cell, which is then increased uh, organification through increased production and activity of thyroid peroxidase, increased production of thyroid globulin, and ultimately increased release of T T4 and T3 in about a 15 to 20 to one ratio. The ratio is different between humans and animals, and that's important if patients are on desiccated uh, thyroid because desiccated thyroid is pig thyroid and that ratio has a higher T3 amount. It's about a five to one ratio, T4 to T3 versus 15 to one ratio. MCT8, which I'll bring up as a disease a mutation and as a disease process just in two slides later in the talk, is important for allowing thyroid hormone to exit the cell and into the bloodstream. Thyroid hormone is further regulated uh, peripherally, uh, both um, in the peripheral um, organs and also at the nucleus. And so there are different uh, diiodinases because T4, which is the more actively produced thyroid hormone, is actually a pro hormone. It needs to be diiodinated to type 3 to, to T3, which is the active form. And type 1 and type 2 diiodinase are differentially expressed in tissues. Type 1 and type 3 are responsible for also inactivating um, the pro hormone T4 to reverse T3. And there are pathologic states where D3 type 3 diagnosis is in, has increased expression and can lead to a, a process, which again, I'll show you in two slides uh, further in the talk. At the nuclear level, T3 has a complex and it, and it binds to the, T, to the thyroid responsive elements within the nucleus, but then leads to increased RNA and, and protein expression and, and a, uh, that are dependent on T3. And there are different nuclear receptors, both alpha and beta. And again, the alpha and beta receptors are differentially expressed within different tissues. And later in the talk, we'll talk about some abnormalities within these nuclear receptors that can present with clinical disease. 
in practice, TFTs are really highly predictive uh, of the disease state. And so when we think about uh, TFTs, we think about TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, T4 and T3. And if you were abandoned on a desert island and the only one you, you only had one test you could order, of course, TSH is the most informative in the majority of situations. However, just like anything else, pretest probability of the likelihood of a disease impacts the positive and negative predictive value of the outcome of TFTs. So you really shouldn't just order tests. You really have to order tests in a context where you believe that there's actually a disease state. So signs, symptoms, physical exam, and then things that sometimes we don't think about very often, iodine status and medications that can impact thyroid hormone production, thyroid hormone binding to binding proteins, and thyroid hormone uh, metabolism are critically important as far as what can interfere with normal thyroid functions. And so there's lots of things where things where uh, TFTs can be altered, um, both that are a pathologic state and sometimes that are just uh, lab abnormalities because of interference with assays or um, related to nutritional deficiencies such as iodine deficiency. These have been summarized in a number of reviewed articles. I just provide this for your reference. So it's nice to have one of these listed somewhere if you end up with you know, thyroid functions and you're trying to figure out, well, that's not the usual low T4, high TSH, hypothyroidism, something doesn't make sense. And this is just a nice way, one nice diagram, one nice figure to help figure that out. So let's start with thyroid hormone uh, embryogenesis. So, in the first trimester, the baby's relying on thyroid hormone from the mom. And HCG, because it has the same alpha subunit, binds to the TSH receptor, and it increases maternal thyroid hormone production by about 50%. T4 then crosses the placenta, and in a decreasing amount over the first, second, and third trimester. As the baby starts to develop its own endogenous thyroid hormone production, there's an increased need for maternal iodine ingestion. And so during pregnancy, that need is about 250 micrograms per day. We're in a normal state, we need about 150 micrograms per day. The same symporter is expressed in the placenta as it is in the thyrocyte, the th sodium iodine symporter, and that's responsible for both active and passive transport of iodine across the placenta to the fetal circulation. You would think in the United States that all of us are gonna be sufficient. We live in a developed country. There's very rare that you see iodine insufficiency and endemic goiter in the United States, thankfully. But you can still have subtle evidence of insufficiency. And this is some figures from a paper in 2018. And so the FDA, if you didn't know, does not mandate listing iodine on products. It doesn't even mandate iodination of salt or of um, different um, foodstuffs. So because of that, the majority of us, because the requirement is relatively low and most people put salt on things, um, most of us are iodine sufficient. But with the increasing practice of using um, kosher salt, sea salt, which have very low iodine, it is possible to have patients that are iodine insufficient, not iodine deficient, but insufficient. Pink Himalayan salt has a little bit of iodine and iodized salt has about 400 micrograms per teaspoon, but it needs to be replaced on about an annual basis because humidity, although that's less important for people on this coast of the country, um, humidity dissipates iodine from iodized salt. So if you have an old container that's years old, uh, you should replace it. And so when you look at pregnant women, there is a chance that many women in the United States are insufficient. And so that's something that all of us has to be aware of because it can impact fetal development and it also can impact thyroid functions uh, on newborn screening. Well, if we say, well, women take prenatal vitamins, and so that should solve it, and you look at the label, and you think, all right, it's a list iodines in the prenatal vitamin, we've got to be covered. That's not necessarily uh, true as well. So this is a study that's now a decade old, looking at over 200 prenatal vitamins, and you can see that 22%, almost a quarter of them were discordant from the label, and the amount of iodine that was found on measurement from the pills taken from the bottles had a mean of about 119, which is less than the 250 requirement. And the range was between 33 and 600 micrograms uh, per dose. The ones that were kelp-based were more likely to have a higher amount of iodine. So if you read the labels, kelp-based seems to have a more consistent and a higher amount of iodine per prenatal vitamin. On the positive, if we can ensure maternal youth thyroidism, even if the baby doesn't have a thyroid, if they have athyroidosis, fetal development is protected, which is a lovely thing as long as we can take care of women 
of childbearing age and ensuring iodine sufficiency. In contrast, if you have maternal hypothyroidism, the most common reason being iodine deficiency or insufficiency or autoimmune hypothyroidism, even if the baby has a normal thyroid, they will not be protected and can be at risk for uh, decreased uh, neurocognitive function, which can be permanent. So let's talk about the etiology congenital hypothyroidism. So we've had testing in the United States since about 1980. Uh, and why that was brought up? Because it was a thing that we could prevent. And when there was a, a treatment that had a positive impact on clinical outcome. And so there is data from 70s and much earlier that if there's a delay in diagnosis and a delay of initiation of thyroid hormone replacement and a de delay in correction of thyroid functions over the age of the baby from zero, to, you know, diagnosed between one and three months, zero and three months, three to six or more than six months, there was a drop in IQ that was not recoverable. And so it's been a major impact, of course, and I don't need to sell that to, you, to this crowd. What happens when the baby is born? Well, then in the first 30 minutes, there's a TSH surge as the baby is delivered, subsequently followed by an increase in T4 uh, production. What many don't realize is that, well, how long does it take to achieve a normal TSH is relatively rapid. So if you look at the majority of babies, term healthy babies, the TSH surge decreases in the first 48 hours and achieves a, a near normal adult range, which is between half and four and a half within the two, first two weeks of life. We all have some kids and especially in endocrinology, we see them where the TSH is less than 20 or less than 10 and it's still not normal at two weeks and we will drag our feet because we know that a majority of those will continue with the downward trend and might just be outliers and eventually achieve a normal TSH by the end of the first four to six weeks post delivery. What about babies that are premature? Well, endocrine, whoever's listening from endocrine, I'm sure gets consulted from the NICU. This happens very frequently, at least in our practice because most babies that are premature, um, do, based on normal physiology for a baby born prior to just normal gestation, will have kind of a youth thyroid sick state, a non-thyroid illness state, because the intrauterine environment has a lower TSH, a lower T4, and a higher reverse T3. That's just part of normal embryogenesis uh, during pregnancy. So when babies are born, they, not, they have a low T4 and a low TSH, and it is related, there is a correlation with the degree of prematurity. And then after that, once the baby is born, then the T4 actually dips lower again in a gestational age dependent manner. And because there's immaturity, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid access, there's a delay in response in TSH. And so you get the triple whammy um, between being born too early and then going through a T4 nadir uh, and an inability to mount a TSH response. And of course, that's all complicated by a baby that oftentimes is sick. And so then they develop low T3 syndrome from non-thyroidal illness and many medications that can impact pituitary functions such as steroids um, uh, and lead to even more difficult to interpret labs. When we look at congenital hypothyroidism and try to figure out why babies develop it, well, the most common is dysgenesis, and two-thirds of these babies will have ectopic uh, gland development. So the thyroid gland, as we know, develops in the kind of the roof of our mouth during fetal development. It, it moves through the foramen cecum, through the tongue, down the anterior portion of the neck, and ultimately ends up in the lower third of our neck in the thyroid bed. So that tissue can get stuck anywhere along the way, and this is just a picture of a baby with a lingual thyroid. Over the last decade, we have increasing knowledge on what the transcription factors are for thyroid gland development as far as, and as well as uh, thyroid gland migration. And these are just listed here. And the point of the figure is to say that many of these um, transcription factors may have been labeled as thyroid transcription factors, but they're actually important for other, in other organ development as well. And so NKX 2.1 in the rodent when it was first described was thyroid transcription factor one. But as you can see here on the upper left, NKX 2.1 isn't just important for thyroid gland development. It's also important for gut development, brain development, and lung development, in particular surfactant uh, uh, production. And so there are a number of um, genes that have now been described in this table. There's at least two more that have now been described that can be identified. You can test for them and identify them. Uh, most of these are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. When to think about sending genetic testing is if you have a baby that not only has hypothyroidism, but also has other congenital anomalies, then you need to start thinking about 
maybe there is a transcription factor. And if this is the first in the family with this disorder, there may be a risk to other babies as well. Just to show you the NKX 2.1 again, the thyroid tr transcription factor, the syndrome is called brain lung thyroid syndrome because there's abnormal development of the thyroid. There's abnormal production of surfactant because NKX, is, NKX 2.1 is important for uh, surfactant development. And the brain development can be ataxia. And babies do not have to have all three of these to be diagnosed. They can have one or two or all three. Um, so this is something that should be thought about for kids that are congenital hypothyroidism that may be having abnormal development, movement disorders, and maybe had a mild or even more significant history of, uh, pre of lung disease during the neonatal period. If 85% are dysgenesis, the other 15% then, if we can make a diagnosis, fall into the category of dyshormonogenesis. Similar to the uh, other slide, there are a number of different genes that are involved in thyroid hormone dysgenesis. The bottom one, um, as you can see here, which is Pendrid, is important, can cause um, ectopic thyroid tissue dysgenesis as well as dyshormonogenesis and can be inherited in both fashions. Most of these are inherited as autosomal in an autosomal recessive pattern. So Pendrid syndrome is one of the early, I think, syndromes associated with sensory neural hearing loss. There's now a whole panel of, pro of uh, proteins that are, that are part of those mutation analysis or genes that are part of the mutational analysis on panels, but it's associated with you know, anatomic abnormalities for formation of the inner ear and congenital uh, and development of goiter and hypothyroidism. The thyroid portion oftentimes does not present during the newborn period, but can develop over time. And there's iodine uh, sufficiency state is important for the expression of the thyroid uh, portion of this syndrome. You can also catch thyroid dyshormonogenesis during fetal life. So here's a baby that was born a couple of years ago now at CHOP that was presented with fetal bradycardia and worsening polyhydramnios and was delivered. And because they had significant uh, thyroid uh, gland hypertrophy, there was tracheal narrowing and respiratory distress and the baby was ultimately intubated. When the TSH came back, it was quite elevated, greater than 500, but within about a week of hormone replacement, the thyroid tissue shrunk and the baby was successfully extubated and is now doing quite well. And so this baby had an abnormality mutation in thyroid peroxidase. Our most recent baby that was born at CHOP um, but we were a little bit more successful because we knew about it a little earlier on, or at least I was engaged a little earlier on, and this baby was found to have a fetal goiter, and you can see on 3D fetal ultrasound here, <laughs> a similar story, but rather than just waiting to delivery, we initiated LT4 amnio infusion therapy, and when the baby was delivered last November, uh, there was no need for intubation because the gland size and the tracheal compression uh, were positively impacted by the T4 um, therapy. And so there are ways to avoid this and using intra uh, amniotic infusion is, is probably the most effective. You can also have patients that, do, that present with dyshormonogenesis down the road, maybe not in the newborn period. And so this is an adolescent that came to our clinic within the last year, had a goiter, had abnormalities on ultrasound that looked like heterogeneous tissue, but had negative antibodies, um, but had a significant elevation in TSH. You can see here 227. And so uh, goiter that presents without an otherwise etiology can be iodine insufficiency or deficiency, uh, but could be a delayed presentation for dyshormonogenesis as well. So there are ways of thinking about when you should order uh, um, genetic testing. And, and the most important, as I alluded to at the beginning, is for patients that have syndromic uh, congenital hypothyroidism. And there are panels. Uh, you don't have to order these as individual genes that you can order to help figure this out or for the clinical um, list of, of um, congenital anomalies fits a specific one, then you can just order mutation analysis for that particular uh, genetic abnormality. There are guidelines for how to evaluate and treat patients with congenital hypothyroidism. The, the first one was in 2014. Actually, there was one before that, and the most recent was in 2021. But the two things I want to bring um, to attention for newborn screening is there are many states in our country that will allow you to submit a newborn screen up to 30 days of life, but there's at least a quarter of those states that don't adjust, age adjust, and this is just one example. So this is an 11-month-old that presented with linear growth failure, as you can see here, and was found to have a TSH of almost 30 at 11 months of age. 
When we went back into the chart, a six day uh, newborn screen was called a pass because the TSH was 27, but it was not age adjusted and that isn't outside of the normal range for that time frame. And so this was a delayed diagnosis because of using newborn screening um, in a short, in a time frame when you should just use peripheral um, venous sampling to obtain thyroid functions if you're thinking about hypothyroidism. So we published this in JPEDS. Um, we contacted all the states and there's 24 of the 50 that had responded that did not adjust for age, even if they take a sample up to a month of age. As far as treatment, um, most of us think about thyroid hormone as a tablet only, um, and that's still true. The majority of patients um, are placed on tablets. It's crushed, put on a teaspoon. Um, it should not be made into a suspension. It's not stable uh, as a suspension. There's also an IV form that we occasionally use in the inpatient environment. Uh, the dose conversion, as you can see there, is 75%. Um, but now in the last two years, there are oral solutions that are available that are commercially produced that are stable. And so there's two oral solutions that are available. One comes in individual dosed aliquots, and the other is a bottle. Uh, so the bottle allows you a little bit more range, and, and you can pick the volume that you're giving to adjust it more uh, closely. Um, but both are available, and I think they're used less frequently, and there may be opportunities to incorporate these into practice for each of your practices, depending on uh, the patient situation. For hypothyroidism or prematurity, we're not gonna have the time to go into how do we treat this, but you sh there should be a protocol in place on how to at least screen for it. And so this is just one example from a paper from 2017. Uh, we also put it in a review paper and, or in a chapter that, I, that was recently published uh, in Poland's most recent uh, edition of fetal neonatal physiology. Uh, and we consider T4 treatment when the TSH is greater than 10 in prematurity because it's so uncommon to have an elevated pre, uh, TSH as we reviewed, it's more common to have a low TSH. The last for congenital hypothyroidism is just this really cool thing that most people are aware of at this point because it's over a decade old, but there are patients that present uh, with consum consumptive hypothyroidism. And so this is a baby that had an elevated TSH and an elevated reverse T3. Um, and required increasing doses of T4 uh, to normalize the TSH. And the etiology of this disorder is increased type 3 deionose expression in endothelial cells. And in this time frame, and for this particular baby, infantile hepatic hemangiomas is on the list for differential. So what can be done? Well, this is now, as you can see, a paper from New England Journal in 2008 on a baby who was put on propranolol because of coincident hypertension had, as you can see, a disfiguring facial and, and potential vision loss um, form of a hemangioma. And it turns out it not only helped correct uh, hypertension, but propranol um, inhibits vascular endothelial growth factor expression and can lead to involution of the, um, over, of the endothelial tumor. And when that happens, there's decreased expression of type 3 deiodinase and resolution of the consumptive hypothyroidism. So that's the majority, and we're now we're going to go into the rest of the acquired thyroid disease and then end with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, mostly the thyroid cancer in a very limited, even though it's an area of my particular area of my research interest. So the things to bring up for acquired hypothyroidism. So this is the classic referral, and for you know, students and residents out there, this is the classic endocrine growth curve. So they maintain normal weight percentile advancement, but they have linear growth failure. And that could be any one of endocrine hormone deficiencies, including thyroid hormone deficiency. There are some patients that present with profound hypothyroidism, and I just bring this up because there's an important clinical piece to this. So this was an almost nine-year-old that presented with acquired hypothyroidism, had no evidence of a large, lymph node, um, large thyroid on exam, but had lab evidence of profound hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism decreases LDL receptor expression, so it, it induces elevations in lipids, in particular total cholesterol and LDL. It decreases uh, hematopoiesis, so you can get an anemia associated with profound hypothyroidism, and it can cause abnormalities in growth. And so this patient actually had a, a skeletal survey because they had disproportionate growth. And on the skeletal survey, they were noted to have an enlarged cell at Tursica. And at the time, an MRI was performed, and they found this mass, which ended up being a pituitary hyperplasia because of thyroid increased production of TSH. So what was the TSH for this patient? The TSH was almost 1,600. 
And I bring this up because everyone would think if your TSH is 1600, you should have a goiter. And if you don't have a goiter, maybe you don't think about thyroid, but it's not the case for these patients and you really need to think about it. And why they don't develop a goiter is because most of these patients develop rapidly progressive autoimmune disease and they have fibrotic Hashimoto's gland and they get atrophy of the gland and maybe the goiter was there, but it quickly um, decreases in size because of the rapid progression of the fibrotic process. And you can see here just on sagittal imaging, an example of fibrotic Hashimoto's. So this has been published in a number of different papers. This is a really nice review paper with almost 62 patients with TSHs greater than 100 and a third of them did not have a goiter. And as you can see from the title, some of them can also have an impact on pubertal development. So you can either have delayed puberty, and if you're peripubertal and you initiate T4, they will have rapid progression through puberty and almost all of them will have short stature, even if you try to block puberty with GnRH agonists and initiate growth hormone therapy, most of them will have stunted growth. You just can't recover from that. But they can also present with pseudoprecocious puberty, which was, has an eponym named after two uh, giants in, in the endocrine, pediatric endocrine field. And why this happens is because there's cross-reaction, again, because that alpha subunit is similar between TSH and, and FSH. And so TSH can bind to FSH. You can get breast development. You can have ovarian enlargement. Um, we've got a patient that presented with ovarian torsion uh, in a prepubertal time frame, and that ultimately she was diagnosed with profound hypothyroidism. You can have testicular enlargement, but because it doesn't impact LH and, and uh, androgen production, you don't have virilization. But again, once these patients are treated and the families need to understand this, you can't make up the lost height and stunted growth is pretty common. Just to complete the story, once you initiate thyroid hormone replacement, you can correct this. The pituitary gland will then involute, but maintain normal function. And when it's enlarged, you can actually have low growth hormone secretion as well. Just compression uh, on the somatotrophs can have that result and it, those will recover as well. As far as the other portion that we see clinically, of course, is everyone wants to blame the thyroid on weight, which is not an unfair thing to think about, but in clinical practice, people need to know, especially the families, that it's less common to have hypothyroidism cause significant weight gain, and it's more common to have weight gain cause an abnormality in your TSH. And so for obesity, TSH shifts to the right, the bell-shaped curve shifts to the right, and the normative, the median of the normal range shifts to the right from a, instead of a half to four and a half type frame, the TSH is also in that sub, is moved to the subclinical range between four and a half and five. And this is a paper published in 2010 showing patients with obesity and those with control sub, uh, non-obese controls. And you can see their difference in their uh, mean um, TSHs. Unfortunately, of course, it's harder to treat obesity than it is hypothyroidism, but if you can achieve weight loss, their TSH will correct, and that's what this uh, figure is showing here. And so this, again, has been published, and, and patients need to realize that um, when they come in and interested in having thyroid evaluated as an explanation for weight gain. The last thing that's really come up, and I hope our, my endocrine colleagues aren't upset by this, because the majority of patients, I'll say it from the on, onset, do fine on T4 monotherapy, but there's a trend now, and, and they're probably seeing it in practice too, to start thinking about combined therapy with T4 and T3. And this has historic precedence. So before we had uh, synthetic T3 and T4, which was developed in the 50s, we had desiccated thyroid and every patient was treated with desiccated thyroid. First it was sheep thyroid, and then it was extracts of sheep thyroid, and then it was um, cow thyroid, and most recently it's pig thyroid that's desiccated. And there's a push for again, organic everything, right? And you know that, especially on this side of the country. So people think that desiccated natural thyroid is better than synthetic thyroid. It's not better, it just happens to be combined because it has T4 and T3. But there's problems because as I mentioned earlier, the ratio is different between a pig thyroid and a human thyroid. But there are ways of initiating you know, T4 and T3 therapy in an easier to control manner. So in the distant past, we had everyone on T4 and T3 because that's all there was. And then in the 70s to 2000s, we went to T4 monotherapy. And that was mostly because we had development of radioimmunoassays in the 70s that allowed for better measurement of T4 and T3. And people realized that desiccated caused high T3 levels. Um, and then people worried about over-treatment. 
And now we're starting to realize, well, maybe somewhere in between. And it's the classic pendulum for any type of subject that you think about. And eventually you find a sweet spot, or at least you do, you think you do, and then the pendulum moves again. But in adults, it's been studied a little bit more than in, in kids. There's at least 10 to 15 patients, uh, percent of patients that are just unhappy in T4 monotherapy, which is amazingly complicated to define what, what unhappy is and what the confounding variables of dissatisfaction are, are, could be. But there is some data on patients with T4 replacement, you know, T4 monotherapy in adults, and a similar percent of patients that are on T4 monotherapy, even if you push their T4 to the upper range of normal. And this is a, a significant number of patients for this study. Even if almost 7% of them are above the normal range, about 15% of them will have a T3 below the normal range. So if you use T4 monotherapy in a patient that's athyreotic, whether they had Hashimoto's or they had a thyroidectomy, even when you push the T4 high in 10 to 15%, the T3 will be at the low end, if not below the lower end of the normal range. We recently looked at data in, in, in our cohort at, at CHOP, and this is pending publication, and it's a similar thing. So this is Graves disease patients that have thyroid hormone replacement. This is thyroid cancer patients where we actually increase the monotherapy dose to suppress the TSH. And so even when you push the T4 up, the majority of patients and pediatric patients will similarly have a T3 in the lower end or, or below the lower end of the normal range. At least one pot potential explanation for this is there are uh, genetic polymorphisms that are associated with decreased effectiveness of the, the, the deodinases, especially the type 2 deodinase. So there's decreased efficiency in converting T4 to T3. And so in training, many people put this under the list of quackery to think about T4, T3 combined therapy. But I think there is ex physiologic reason why um, this could happen for some patient, at least 10 to 15% of patients that it may be happening in. And we need to figure out how do we measure effectiveness of therapy if we put them on combined therapy. But if you normalize other thyroid levels, I think the risk of doing that is low. So monotherapy for the majority of patients um, and generic or brand name, we don't have time to talk about. Tablets and solution uh, are the way to go, not suspensions. Additional resource, research is needed in how do we use combined therapy and we need more research in pediatrics similarly to adults. And then there's a bunch of opportunities for just using T3 therapy in a, a bunch of different disorders, including hypothalamic obesity, congestive heart failure, where it appears to have inotropic effects, which has been studied in adults, and also in recalcitrant depression, which has also been studied in adults. So lots of opportunity, even in a field that is now decades and decades old, um, to improve care for some of our patients. For hyperthyroidism, I think most of us think about Graves' disease, but it turns out that the differential diagnosis is a little bit broader than just Graves' disease, and you can see the list here, and we're not going to go through all of these, um, but just to bring it up for your awareness. In particular for Graves' disease, the one thing I want to drive home is that there are the common signs and symptoms, but oftentimes we don't think about proptosis, and it really happens in about a third of our patients. So thankfully, they do not get active inflammatory eye disease, but they definitely get cosmetic eye disease where they can have proptosis, it can be asymmetric, they can get lid lag ptosis, and they can even get eyelid retraction. And as you normalize, there is a relationship with the TSI, and as you normalize the antibody levels, those things will correct. So the symptoms, of course, are much different. Um, and so many of us as endocrinologists can walk in a room and do a clinical diagnosis, um, the likelihood of Graves' disease. But the one that we sometimes see a delay, there's often a delay in Graves' disease because it's kind of a slowly slow onset as far as signs and symptoms. And we sometimes have patients that are sent for cardiology for unexplained tachycardia, or they're sent for anxiety disorder, and ultimately it's hyperthyroidism or they're sent um, because of late onset ADD, ADHD that did not, did not present during school age time, but were otherwise well. And then during their more formative years um, into high school, they develop ADD, ADHD, and there's social things that could impact that. The Graves' disease is an organic diagnosis is on the list as well. And it turns out that there isn't a really great correlation between the T3 and T4 level. It's kind of individualized how much that impacts neurocognitive function. But we also have recently studied this and we've done a neurocognitive battery uh, with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavior Med at, at Penn. Um, and it looks like domains that are associated with ADD are impacted by high T3, T4, which would make sense. Uh, 
but that they normalize once you normalize T3 and T4 function. And so there is, again, another way of improving and, not, and avoiding pa putting patients on meds uh, that are treating anxiety and ADD when it might be easier and, and more direct to treat the hyperthyroidism. So in contrast to hypothyroidism, T3 is absolutely important to measure, um, to give you an indication. So the TSH should be suppressed, not just low. In autonomous nodules, it may be low normal, but in full-blown autoimmune hyperthyroidism, it's typically suppressed. The T3 can ele be elevated and it can be elevated earlier. There can be earlier T3 thyroid toxicosis before the T4 goes up. 50% of patients will have the antibodies of Hashimoto's. And so that shouldn't be confused that they have Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. Autoimmune thyroid disease is a spectrum. 50% have TPO and TG antibodies. But the diagnostic antibody, of course, is thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin uh, that attaches to the TSH receptor and drives overproduction. There's other disorders that are associated with hyperthyroxinemia, increased T4. And you can see this listed again here by a review article from Sam Rafatov out of Chicago. Some of these are associated just with lab abnormalities and do not have a clinical correlate. Patients are asymptomatic and do not have clinically important disease, but their labs are abnormal. And those are increased thyroid binding globulin uh, production as well as familial dysalbuminemic hyperthyroxinemia, where there's an increased binding of T4 to albumin, and it throws off the T4 assay. And it also can throw off the free T4 assay, which doesn't make complete sense, but it depends on the assay. So it is possible, and direct analysis, equilibrium dialysis dial analysis is less impacted uh, by FDH than FD4 direct uh, radioimmunoassay. Again, we won't have time to go through all the different things that it can interfere with thyroid hormone assays, but there are, again, nice review articles, and I list one here for reference. Some of these interferences can cause a false increase. Some of them can cause a false decrease. I think the two things that are important to remember is here's a patient that came in, as you can see, even last year that was taking, T, you know, had a high TSH, 47, 44, 50, and was given T4 and seemed to take it and seemed to absorb it because their T4 went up had negative antibodies and normal ultrasound, and then ultimately referred to our thyroid center to try to figure out what was going on. Um, we thought about, it didn't make sense. Um, so we thought lab assay interference, which is a great time to think about maybe interference if things don't make sense. So we stopped it and we just switched the platform that the TSH was being run on. And you can see that it was a platform dependent um, uh, interference with the assay. PEG precipitation is polyethylene glycol precipitation, and it binds uh, large proteins and can help decrease interference because you can have macro TSH where there's antibodies attached to TSH that cause false elevation. The ones that's really important is biotin, which is used more and more because they swear it helps with nails, uh, to strengthen hair and nails. I'm not sure if it does or doesn't, but I know it can mess up thyroid labs. And so it can give you pseudo hyperthyroidism. And most of these are you know, massive amounts of biotin. So we might need 75 micrograms as our daily requirement, but these supplements have 1,000 to 5,000, and they can cause your T4 and T3 to go up and your TSH to go down. And if you stop them, they will correct. So I tell patients, I have no idea if they help, but you will, you know, you'll pee out the extra. But the thing you need to do if you're getting thyroid function is stop them 48 hours to 72 hours. So it doesn't interfere with the assays that are relying on strep at. Uh, biotin labeling, where you can have false uh, impact on the, on the assays. The other thing that's really important to realize is that it's not just assays, thyroid hormone assays, it's most of the endocrine assays as well. And so it is an important thing to ask about patients because, you know, we usually ask about drugs and we see whatever is an epic and we don't ask about over-the-counters, but this is an important thing to ask about. For the syndromes, I'll only bring up and then we'll move our the final couple of minutes into thyroid cancer is that there are a number of thyroid hormone syndromes that impact the that are caused by mutations and some of the things that we mentioned earlier in this review. So resistance to thyroid hormone beta is more common than resistance to thyroid hormone alpha, but those are mutations in the nuclear receptors and they're associated with a clinical spectrum of disease. And the other one that we'll talk about just for a slide is Allen Herndon Dudley syndrome, which is caused by a mutation in the MCT8 transporter, which is responsible for thyroid leaving the thyroid site, thyroid site, but it's also important for T3 entering into uh, cells in the central nervous system.
So RTH beta is listed here as you can see the spectrum of, of um, clinical presentation, clinical features, attention deficit, especially recalcitrant attention deficit with a goiter um, is consistent with RTH beta. And what you typically see for both of these syndromes is inappropriately normal TSH with a high T3 and T4. And so it's not a low TSH, it's just inappropriately normal because they have resistance uh, to thyroid hormone. And again, the expression of the disease depends on what, um, where the mutation is expressed in a tissue dependent manner. Alan Hearn and Dudley, I'll just bring up for two things. One, because we're part of an international study, but also because it's really quite interesting because there's, uh, you know, it's really a devastating clinical disease that we're at the cusp of maybe having an impact as far as clinical care. So as I mentioned, T3, MCT8 is important for T3 to get into the cells in the, in the central nervous system, but not peripherally. And so it's the worst of the worst situation where you have profound central hypothyroidism and peripheral hyperthyroidism, and you have an elevated T3, that's the marker um, for the disorder. And ultimately, patients die from disease sometime in their third to fourth decade of life from malnutrition, sepsis, and subsequent arrhythmia. But in the last year, a couple of years now, there is a re-look re at a thyromimetic called TRIAC, which is a metabolite of T3 that actually was used to treat myxedema in the 50s. And it turns out TRIAC can get into these cells in the central nervous system independent of MCT8. And so there's trials going on now, and at least the preliminary data shows that you can decrease the heart rate using TRIAC, you can increase body weight using TRIAC. And for young patients, this is age up to about age four, there may be improvements in, in motor function as well. And so we're part of a trial now looking at age zero to 30 months, and we have multiple patients, about eight patients on TRIAC. Um, and it's also being used intrauterine for patients that have a previous pregnancy with a baby with MCT8, because the earlier you're treated, even during the intrauterine timeframe, the higher the impact will be on, decrease, on in positive impact on neurocognitive outcome. So to wrap things up, I'm just going to bring up thyroid cancer kind of in the recent information we have on the genetics and how we're using driver um, genetic information to help stratify surgery and, and medical treatment. And so thyroid cancer is listed here as the different forms of thyroid cancer. And um, again, I'll leave that for reference. But for the general pediatrician, the most common presentation is an asymptomatic nodular mass and persistent cervical adenopathy. And so it's on the list, and this is a prepubertal patient, but it, especially in adolescent girls, think about thyroid. Why it spreads to the lateral neck, and this is papillary thyroid cancer, and where it spreads to is actually pretty predictable because the lymphatic drainage of the thyroid is pretty well defined. So it usually goes to the central neck first, and then depending where the tumor is, it'll go to the lateral neck, either levels three and four or two and three or all three if it's a very infiltrative lesion. We occasionally pick it up incidentally on non-thyroid imaging, and so it's not really how you pick it up because patients are asymptomatic, it's what you pick up. And this is a patient that accidentally swallowed a foreign body, was found to have tracheal deviation, had no symptoms, and had massive lymphadenopathy from metastatic papillary thyroid cancer. So we wrote guidelines, and as Hillary mentioned, we're now working on a revision of the first guidelines. And the good news within pediatric thyroid cancer is disease-specific mortality is low. So that's not the, we're not making an impact on mortality, thankfully. We're lucky with that. We're trying to decrease complications and stratify care and save thyroid tissue when we can save it and not save it when we shouldn't be saving it because of the risk of metastasis. How we stratify patients for what their care is, is mostly non-genetic up until the last about 10 years. So it's exam, ultrasound, fine needle aspiration, and then you use that to decide on surgery or surveillance. But over the last decades, we have a better understanding of what the driver oncogenes are for taking a normal thyroid cell and converting it either to hyperfunctioning or to a follicular lesion or to papillary thyroid cancer and ultimately into differentiated thyroid cancer. The same is true, of course, for normal cell C cells that convert to medullary thyroid cancer, and that's a ret proto-oncogene mutation. These are the things we're still doing research on because within each of these driver alterations, there are, of course, other portions of that activating process as far as RNA-seq, microRNA, epigenomic information, tumor microenvironment that impact dormancy, metastasis, response to therapy, and that's ongoing research. But how can we use these oncogenes to help di improve diagnosis, stratify care, and select 
precision medicine is actually in clinical practice now. So this is the adult got, uh, information that is now, you know, seven years old, eight years old. And they really nicely on a multi-omic analysis kind of divided papillothyroid cancer into RAS-like, which was less invasive, and BRAF-like, which was more invasive. We just published in JCO that in pediatrics, it's a little bit more of a three-tiered system. RAS is less invasive, BRAF is in between invasive, and the fusion oncogenes, RET, NTRAC, ALK, are more associated with metastatic disease in regard to lymph node metastasis in the lateral neck and in regard to pulmonary metastasis, the most common location for distant METs in PTC and pediatrics. And so I was invited to participate in the WHO uh, Pediatric Blue Book, and I just received actually yesterday a link. Um, it looks like it should be out later this year where I'm, we have, we're using the data to recommend how you could use the oncogene information to potentially stratify the surgical approach. And interestingly, now, how can we use it to help treat patients <coughs> using systemic um, chemotherapy? <coughs> so the initial genes that were, um, the initial targets of therapy were tyrosine kinase inhibitors that mostly targeted VEGF receptors, um, FGF receptors, EGF receptors, and those are quite helpful in causing regression. They can be associated, of course, with some side effects, hypertension, dermatitis, other things. And now over the last couple of years, there's an increasing number of oncogene-specific inhibitors that are, appear to be more effective. And so we're now going into more precision medicine. And if you know the somatic driver, selecting an agent for patients that might benefit from systemic therapy, which we're still working on defining who those patients are, um, is a, a, a nice way of approaching this. And so my delve into systemic therapy occurred you know, with this first patient who has radioactive iodine, and these two white areas are the diffuse micronodular disease of um, PTC metastasis in the lungs. And despite being avid disease, she had progression and was becoming um, dyspneic um, because of her progressive lung disease. At the time, she had a RET-PTC fusion. She has a RET-PTC fusion, but at the time, we didn't have RET inhibitors, so she was put on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, lumbatinib, and you can see the marked response. And in fact, she's still on it and doing quite well. So here's a, just an example again. So here's a patient, one of our patients that had radioactive iodine avid disease, had a treatment because they had pulmonary mets and then developed patchy uptake. So likely decreased NIS expression, decreased avidity for some of the tissue in the lungs. And they had progressive pulmonary disease and they were based on lerotractinib and NTRAC inhibitor. And you can see the response to therapy. Interesting now, there's a adult data and now in the middle here is pediatric data that some of these agents can increase the expression of NIST. So this is a patient, the same patient, pre and post oncogene specific inhibitor therapy where there's no radioactive iodine uptake in the lungs. And then there is similarly a pediatric patient and then another adult patient using an NTRAC inhibitor. And this is the last slide I'll show you from a patient and then, and then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be done. Hopefully there's time for questions. And we're even using these agents now as neoadjuvant and maybe not even taking patients to surgery. So here's the patient that presented with sporadic medullary thyroid cancer that was highly morbid, ended up being intubated for weeks, um, was started on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, then the ALK fusion came back, was placed on an ALK inhibitor, and has done so well as far as regression of disease that they have yet to have surgery, and it's medullary thyroid cancer, which is low likelihood of achieving surgical remission. And so the patient is maintained on electinib without surgery. So we have an advanced pediatric thyroid cancer therapeutics clinic. I work with Ted Leach, who's a thyroid developmental, a thyroid, uh, pediatric oncologist who specializes in rare tumors and developmental therapeutics. And our community, including the ATA guideline committee, is trying to figure out what we can do as far as recommendations to how to incorporate these therapies into practice. It's not every patient. It's a small number of patients that benefit, but the patients that benefit, there's a significant opportunity for improvement. So with thyroid cancer, it really is the era of oncogenes, just like every other cancer. And these, and these drivers are actually tumor agnostic. These drugs work across different types of cancers. It's more dependent on what the cancer is, what the driver is rather than what the cancer is. So with that, I'll end um, and just thank my team at CHOP. I'm fortunate to have this amazing team and it's grown over the years to, as you can see here, a pretty impressive team. We have our clinical team here with our two surgeons, Scott Adzik and Ken Kazahaya. My clinical research team led by Amber Isaza. We have a translational lab with a PhD scientist and three mouse models. 
And then my clinical uh, collaborators, Goli Mustafi Moab, who's dual boarded Endo Ankh, and Ted, as I mentioned, and then the people who really run the show, uh, who I can't live without, they can live without me probably, uh, Lindsay and Stephanie, my nursing nurse practitioner. So with that, I'll end and hope uh, it wasn't too much and hopefully it was a little bit of things across the spectrum of people attending today. So thank you again for this honor. And if there's any time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, and then there's my email below if there are questions that we can't get to today. Wonderful. Andy, thank you so much. This is a fantastic talk with a lot of great tidbits that I, I was surprised to, to learn a lot about uh, animals and humans. Um, just great. First, first a plug for the YouTube videos for thyroid exam. I think I still struggle with uh, pediatric thyroid exam. It's not easy. So um, I think for all of us, I, I would highly recommend that, uh, that YouTube video. Excellent. Um, lots of, lots of expressions of gratitude on, on the chat. And then I kind of have a, um, question that's kind of related. I was thinking about, um, thyroid studies in hospitalized patients. I think, you know, we certainly get a lot of calls about, um, premature babies with, you know, abnormal thyroid function tests. Um, how do you often respond to say, um, you know, children with abnormal thyroid function tests who are hospitalized for other reasons? So one advantage is, at least when we're on consult service, it's a week long. And so what we typically do is kick it down the road a little bit. If it's a patient that has a low TSH and a low T form, we're, we're thinking that it's, um, you know, non-thyroidal illness or just non-thyroidal illness compounded by prematurity. Um, and so we just follow, we try to follow that kind of paradigm that I showed on the one slide for, for babies that are premature. For other kids that are in the ICU, it's again, interesting to look at, and there's more adult data, of course, and there is pediatric data, but there really is no evidence that tra treating patients with, with what we used to call euthyroid six syndrome, um, which is more appropriately non-thyroidal illness or low T3 syndrome, because T3 is the most important marker. And no so there's no evidence that treatment impacts, positively impacts the outcome when you have non-thyroidal illness. So we don't treat unless the TSH is elevated. I was thinking to myself, apparently, when it ended. Awesome. Well, I think, I think that's all the time we have for questions. I really appreciate your being here with us and your talk was fantastic. Much, much appreciated. Again, thanks for the invite and please feel free to contact me. Those emails work um, if you have any questions that we didn't have time for. So thanks. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.